I asked poor Dr. Wynn. <laughs> I, I said, you know, how about if we have a terminology session this year? I think that would be really, I remember when I first started getting into bleeding disorders, they were throwing out these acronyms. I thought the, there was a, I honestly thought there was another language for bleeding disorders that was made completely of acronyms because I couldn't follow anything. So I asked him, you know, here we go. Let's, can we, you know, have a session on these terms. And I, I only sent him about three sheets of terms to have to deal with. Well, he went be above and beyond. And the above and beyond you all found in your folders when you checked in. And there is a sheet of terminology um, that we think is, is good for you as severe VWD patients to understand. It's not the be all end all of all lists, but we wanted to make sure at least we're addressing those kind of concepts. So now Dr. Wynn's gonna take um, some time and just kind of go through what's going on. If, if you don't get it all or whatever, you have that reference sheet now, all right? So hang on to it because it's, it's gonna be helpful for you. And with that, are you ready? I am ready. All right. Yeah, so. Have at it. Thank you. So yeah, and, and just to kind of finish the conversation that Jeanette and I had regarding the session, you know, we, we wanted you guys to have this, this list of terminology so that as we're presenting at the meeting today, but also as and tomorrow, at, as you go back and talk to your physicians and talk to, you know, your kids and talk to your friends and your family, you know, it would be good for you to really understand those concepts and understand those terms and really kind of have good, you know, and productive conversations with, uh, with, with your providers and, and your friends and family and really kind of have it affect, you know, the, the, the type of care that you're receiving. So um, first of all, you know, I, um, just my, my declarations as far as my, um, uh, my involvement with industry and sponsors, you know, so I do have some in involvement uh, and uh, in, uh, I think my wife also is uh, employed, but none of those, um, uh, uh, certainly that doesn't affect anything we have uh, to talk today. So, um, you know, um, so when Jeanette asked me to do this and gave me kind of here's the list of terms that I, we think is, is going to be uh, relevant, you know, I, I didn't want to just give it as a presentation, you know, so that's kind of why we came up with the list. You know, it's simple enough to provide our patients with, uh, with the, the terms and the definitions, uh, and at, at that point, I know that you guys know what they are. You know, really the task and the goal that I have set for myself today is to really make sure that you understand those terms and, uh, and, and really know what they, they mean. Uh, and uh, and I, uh, I'm going to just um, uh, give you kind of um, uh, an overview of how I would do this. So you know, I will give the terms to you and the definitions again, you know, but I'm not going to just read them to you. So really I want to take those terms and really kind of Put them into a context and put them into kind of use, you know, so that um, it can be really uh, highlighted a little bit better and, and illustrated. So, you know, to, to start with, then, you know, we're going to talk about you know, um, bleeding uh, and, and how to stop the bleeding, and that's kind of what hemostasis is. Um, so, and, and these are just very, very kind of really basic concepts as far as kind of cladding goes. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, Dr. Uh, Montgomery actually went through this uh, quite well. But um, maybe I can illustrate it in a different way to, to, to have it understood. So, and then, you know, we want to kind of really also talk about von Willebrand's disease and kind of what von Willebrand's disease might be. You know, and we talked about the various types. You know, um, it was kind of enlightening that we were talking so much about, you know, kind of how do we define these patients with low vinyl bands and these, you know, with type ones. Uh, and, and quite honestly, that low vinyl bands category should not affect anybody in this room. You know, this, this conference is for patients who have severe who are type threes and type two A's and type, you know, uh, two B's uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, patients with 30 to 50 percent, you know, typically are not the patients that are going to be sitting here in front of me today. So first of all, then, you know, hemostasis. So this is kind of um, hemostasis. You know, and, uh, and uh, bleeding, you know, really essentially is a disruption of the blood vessel. So uh, a, an injury, you know, causes a tear in the blood vessel and the blood leaves your blood vessel. So that's bleeding at its core. You know, what happens once that, once that occurs is that, you know, a clot needs to form. And, you know, the blood is rushing by and these, uh, and the substances in the blood will see that there's this break. 
And the very, very first thing that needs to happen is something needs to anchor that clot. Something needs to kind of tie down the platelets and all the substances are there. So, and, and, and that happens because there's, there's a backbone to the blood vessel and the, and the blood vessel backbone is what um, will, will, will allow the, these proteins to anchor to them. That, that first step of anchoring proteins to the blood vessel is what we consider primary hemostasis or another term would be adhesion of, uh, of, of platelets to the blood vessel. You know, von Willebrand's plays a very, very important part in providing that anchor system for, for the platelets to form on it. The next step is secondary hemostasis. Once that anchor is formed, then we need to make sure that we develop a critical mass, you know, develop a plug per se to, um, uh, of, of enough material. You know, and, and that happens by the platelets that are anchored recruiting more platelets to come and attach themselves. You know, that process is called secondary hemostasis. Uh, and, and that too is, that role is provided by von Willebrand's to to um, aggregate these plates together. Platelet aggregation is, is another term for that. And then lastly, you know, we talk about the, the, the proteins and cement and the binder that holds this platelet together so that it simply doesn't fall apart by the rushing of the blood as it passes by and stabilizing the clots so that there's you know, um, uh, uh, time for healing to occur on the blood vessel. And that last step is coagulation where all these proteins are activated and amplified and, uh, and fibrin is formed. You know, uh, von Lillebrand's doesn't play the direct role in coagulation, but it has that secondary role of helping to bring one of the very, very important proteins, which is factor eight, into that coagulation cascade. So, yeah, um, and if you were to kind of look at, uh, 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 look at it a different way, you know, von Lillebrand's protein really plays a, kind of a role in three very, very important parts of the coagulation. You know, it plays a role in platelet adherence, it plays a role in platelet aggregation, and it plays a role as a carrier for, for, for the factor eight. So, so um, testing, you know, we talked a lot about testing today, you know, and, uh, and how, how in the different ways that we measure it. And so these are, are the different, you know, kind of uh, typical measurements on a standard uh, uh, Van Lindervan's screen or Van Lindervan's panel. So, um, and we use those tests, those, those series of tests to really kind of describe the type of Van Lindervan's that, that we have, that, that you have. You know, um, and this is an, an old table, you know, kind of describing the various different types. And what I wanted to do was to really uh, um, bring in kind of the new diagnostic guidelines. You know, I think we mentioned it a couple of times now to uh, uh, a number of societies and organizations, you know, um, uh, involved with caring for patient bleeding disorder came together and developed really new guidelines on how do we interpret these, these results. Um, and, and so, you know, the most recent guidelines are these, the ASH, I-S-T-H-A, um, I-S-T-H, N-H-F, and W-F-H, you know, are the organizations, and, and they kind of give us guidance on how do we interpret the data and how do we categorize and classify our patients. You know, the, uh, I think, you know, our discussion this morning, the, the biggest change was for the type 1 patients and kind of how do we really kind of uh, incorporate uh, but still distinguish patients who have those levels between between 10 and 50 or 30 and 50 percent, you know. And really, these guidelines, if you were to really narrow it down, say go ahead and treat those patients like they have type 1 von Willebrand's disease, so that they can get the care that they need. So um, the, what I've highlighted are the subgroups that are the severe von Willebrand subtypes, or or can be the severe uh, 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 subtypes, uh, and uh, and it's the uh, type 1s and type 3s that cause, you know, num numeric deficiencies of those proteins, and it's the type 2s that have a functional uh, defici deficiency of the proteins. And with the functional deficiencies, the, the deficiencies that are more likely to result in the, uh, the, the, the worst problems and the lowest activity uh, measure is going to be your type 2A and your type 2Bs. So um, you've heard this morning and a lot all about multimers as well, and I think you know um, uh, Dr. Montgomery did a great job, you know, really kind of uh, elucidating kind of what the importance of 
pro, uh, the von Lurens protein being able to form into multimers and how they do that are. You know, I think probably the, the take home point with multimers is that the um, uh, large multimers are probably what is most critical in terms of um, how von Lurens forms a, a, um, a clot. You know, uh, and it's really um, the, the function of the, the loss of that function in the type 2 A's and the type 2 B patients, you know, that cause them cause those patients to have such problems. Uh, and uh, and uh, the other point with multimers is that type 3 patients don't make any von Willebrand's protein. So not only do they not have von Willebrand's protein, but they have no von Willebrand's multimers to, uh, to, to build into. So. Um, severe von Willebrand's disease, so that's a tough one, you know, because um, with severe von Willebrand's disease, we as a, uh, you know, as a community actually don't have a great definition or an agreed upon definition on what, you know, severe von Willebrand's disease really is. You know, and if we were to try to kind of narrow it down, the basis for von Willebrand's disease and what's severe and what's not severe is not the, the, the laboratory testing so much, it really boils down to, you know, how does the bleeding affect our patients? You know, and, and, and so at its heart, you know, a severe von Lebrens patient should be somebody who has, you know, difficulty and severe difficulty with their, with their bleeding. And then we try to take those patients and niche them, put them into categorizations as far as their, their type goes and their laboratory testing. So um, bleeding, you know, bleeding is, is, is interesting, you know, because we, you, you hear it described in so many different ways, uh, and, uh, and, and the terms are kind of thrown around uh, kind of in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, kind of as, uh, as, as common, you know, kind of uh, vernacular, but it really, you know, is quite complex. And, uh, and I'm, you know, I wanted to kind of give you the sheets because everybody's going to kind of see what the definitions are, but I thought the best way to kind of do bleeding is you know, kind of give you guys a quiz on it. So, you know, you guys have had hopefully a chance to study, you know, the last slide I showed and now, um, uh, and, and the sheet that you have. So I'm gonna, gonna put you guys up to a contest and uh, to really kind of match up these terms and their definitions. And the contest is not amongst yourselves. The contest is with one of our distinguished speakers, Dr. Dr. Walsh. So he'll help, I bet you he'll probably be able to kind of match this up a little bit faster than you are, so, but we're gonna go ahead and do it and, uh, and see if you guys can, can, can match those terms. So we'll give you like 30 seconds or so. So yeah, so everybody here is gonna match with Dr. Dr. Walsh and you're, everybody's gonna get the final Jeopardy question right. So there's the answer key. So yeah, you know, so when we talk about bleeding, you know, like I said, bleeding is really just bl blood that's leaving the blood vessel. But we use terms in ter uh, to describe it just as, as adjectives. You know, it bleeding into the joint is a joint bleed. Um, bleeding in from the nose is epistaxis. Bleeding, you know, um, with menstrual bleeding is menorrhagia, you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, these terms are, are, are terms that are just, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of that's like memori memorizing a, a dictionary. All right. So, you know, so what are some terms that you need to know when you're talking about treating your von Lebrand's disease? So, you know, and, and these are some, um, some 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 wording that we kind of put together for it. So. Um, and, uh, and another question is, you know, kind of you know, as you're thinking about treatment, you know, where does that factor come from? You know, what is it at its core, you know, and why would I want to kind of receive that, that specific factor? So, um, so if you're, you know, look, talking to your physician and talking about, you know, so how do I choose my, my treatment? You know, probably one of the very first things that you want to ask when they provide or offer treatments to you is what's the indication for that treatment? And the indication is really kind of what is that, that treatment going to be used for? What is that factor going to be used for? And, and very specifically, is that indication that's going to be used for, you know, approved, FDA approved here in the U.S., or is it an off-label indication? You know, both are perfectly fine, but it's fair for you to understand, you know, kind of what the nature of, you know, the purpose of the use of the therapy is going to be. Um, uh, another term that's used is ABR, or annualized bleeding rates. 
So, you know, we try to s simplify it as much as we can for our patients in terms of, you know, if one factor, you know, um, how effective is one factor versus another factor versus another factor. And that's what ABRs are. It's the annualized bleeding rate is how much does a person bleed on any given treatment. You know, um, and it's really the, 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 uh, the average you know, amount of bleeding that occurs over a year's time. Uh, it's one way, and it's a simplified way, to compare how much bleeding can uh, or does occur. You know, um, it's simplified, and so we have to be careful about it to understand it, because you have to remember that there's more to bleeding than simply just kind of the number of times it happens. You know, even with factor every day, you're probably going to be, you know, episodes of bleeding that occurs uh, in, in everybody. Um, the, uh, the annualized bleeding rate may be affected by, for example, you know, how much physical activity you have. If you're someone who likes to exercise, ride a bike, you know, uh, run uh, and, and do something very, very physical every day, your annualized bleeding rate is probably going to be higher than somebody who is less active, you know, uh, and it probably doesn't matter, you know, how much factor you're on, you know, there's, it's uh, going to be a certain time, you know, a certain instance where that activity will lead to, to bleeding and injury. So, so, be, so the annualized bleeding rate is there as a way to compare, but you have to be careful that you, you know, put it into, the, into your own context. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of um, desmopressin as another treatment choice. Um, uh, desmopressin is the DDAVP, the, uh, the, the nasal spray, um, and, uh, and desmopressin, you know, can correct factor levels by using endogenous factor, the factor that our bodies produce for, for ourselves, for, for yourself, whether it's enough or not enough. Uh, for a patient who has type 3, where you don't produce any, you know, there's never going to be enough because you don't produce any. You know, in which case, a type, a patient who has type three vulnerable bands, is not going to be able to access endogenous factor. They're going to need to be treated with exogenous factor, which is factor replacement and the factor infusions. So, you know, choosing a factor. So, you know, there are some big concepts as far as how do you choose one factor from, from another, you know, um, and these are some of the things to consider. So, you know, plasma concentrates are the, 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 the tried and the true and have been the stalwarts, you know, that have been around for us for a very, very long time now. Um, you know, uh, a plasma concentrate means that this factor product that you're receiving came from plasma. You know, people who went to donate their plasma has given this to the company, and the company will take all those donors, will pull them together, and then concentrate the, the, the von Uller bands, and incidentally, the factor eight out of that as well. Or if you're a hemophiliac, you'll consider that they concentrated the factor eight, and incidentally, contract, get, uh, concentrated the, the von Uller bands factor that's there. So uh, the, 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 the point is, in plasma, you know, you're always gonna find an amount of von Lutterbrand's protein that's there, and you're always gonna find an amount of factor eight that's there. So, you know, the plasma concentrates, you know, you take, can take comfort in the fact that plasma concentrates are the most commonly used treatment for von Lutterbrand's factor uh, in patients, uh, and uh, you can take comfort in the fact that for, you know, with decades of use now, you know, we know that it's a safe and effective therapy. You know, an alternative to plasma concentrates, you know, as alluded to with, you know, kind of some of the difficulties we had with plasma in the past, you know, HIV, hepatitis B, uh, in the hemophilia community primarily, you know, um, uh, uh, resulted in, you know, more and more uh, factors being produced and utilized in a recombinant fashion. You know, recombinant factor means that this factor was manufactured. It was made in a laboratory and did not come from a human person. We made it because we understand and know the DNA. We understand the sequence that these proteins you know, have, and we can use that knowledge to sequence the DNA and then use that, that, that template to produce the protein from it. You know, um, uh, the, 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 so it's, it's, uh, so it's, it's an alternative to the plasma concentrate. You know, um, uh, some of the, the challenges with it, you know, is the fact that the recombinant, you know, um, a factor is uh, only contains the von Willebrand's protein. Because we're specifically targeting the production of von Willebrand's, there is no factor eight that contains, it, uh, that, that it contains. And we do know that 
you know, factor eight can be very, very important in a clot, especially in the, the stopping of a clot that happens very, very suddenly uh, and you've not had the factor before. So because it is a newer um, a medication, you know, it has new and different indications for it. Uh, and really kind of one of the things I wanted to mention as far as indications go is very, very excitedly, it's the first and really at this point still the only factor product that actually has a prophylaxis indication. The FDA has eval evaluated and has seen the data and feel it's safe and is effective to use in a preventative fashion. You know, not that the other products can't and can't be used off-label, but the FDA hasn't evaluated their data yet. So um, the, the, the biggest point between plasma and recombinant therapy is that both therapies are safe and both therapies are effective. You know, and it really is up to you as patients to really, you know, decide and look at, you know, this is the right one for me, this is the effective one for me, and this is the one I feel safest using, and using your knowledge to make a decision on, on which you want to use. So um, uh, when we talk about factor and treatment, you know, uh, you've heard already, you know, talk about, you know, kind of treatment when it's on demand and treatment when we use it in a prophylaxis fashion. Um, and, and the reason why I think everybody here has heard so much about prophylaxis is that those new guidelines that I mentioned to you that came out in 2021 looked at very, very specifically patients with type 3 von Leerbrand's disease and the consensus from, from all those great experts who, 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 were, who, were, who were developing them felt that type 3 patients sh uh, can benefit and should benefit from prophylactic therapy. Uh, and, uh, and so clearly the guidelines are telling us, you know, we should have more patients with type 3, you know, getting prophylactic therapy and we should be having these discussions with our patients. So um, factor, you know, also can be evaluated based upon half-life. You know, and it can be evaluated, you know, um, as far as kind of the, 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 um, the, the response goes, you know, with PK data, which is based upon peaks and, and troughs, you know, which is what Carrie had asked earlier on in, uh, in, in the day. So, so when you administer factor, you know, if you ask about and somebody tells you about half-life, what they're referring to is, you know, how long does that factor, you know, last in my bloodstream after I infuse it? You know, if you infuse a factor and it's there, but it disappears in three or four hours, uh, that's very, very different than if you infuse a factor, it's there and it disappears after 24 or 36 hours. You know, that there's a much more effectiveness if it lasts a little bit longer, presumably. The, so um, the half-life is how we express that, you know, um, uh, amongst ourselves. And what it really is telling you is, you know, if I were to measure the factor after I infuse it, after um, uh, the time, the, the half-life is the time that it would take for that factor at its highest level to reduce down to half of what it, it was previously. So um, on average, we think about factor eight and von Lillebrand's being approximately 12 hours as, as a half-life. You know, um, and you know, so you kind of take half lives. You know, 12 hours. If you treat to 100% in 12 hours, it'll be 50%. 12 hours after that, which is 24 hours, it'll be at 25%. 12 hours after that, or 36 hours, it'll be at 12.5%, and so on and so forth until it's gone again. So. Um, so when it comes to treatment and bleeding, you know, there, the concept of peaks and troughs are important. So, you know, when we talk about peaks, you know, peaks, it, the peak concentration of a factor um, infusion is the highest level you can achieve with it. So, um, so that, that typically is the level that you want to achieve when you're trying to treat a bleed, you know, that's going on. You know, uh, if you have a nosebleed, for example, you know, uh, targeted concentrations might be to get the levels up to 40 to 60 percent. Or if you have a joint bleed, and uh, you know, you, you might target a peak concentration to get to 80 or 100 percent. You know, to um, to treat you know um, a, a joint bleed that's problematic, or to treat uh, bleeding in the GI tract, you might not want to just get to the peak of 80 or 100 percent but you want to kind of maintain that peak level at those approximate levels for as long for, for a longer period of time. So that's what peak is all about is, you know, how high can I get this level and most uh, most importantly how high can I get this level so that I can stop 
any sort of bleeding that's occurring um, uh, for, uh, uh, for the patient. Um, trough is uh, um, a little different. So trough, rather than being the highest level, the trough concentration is the lowest level. So the, the trough concentration is the level that you're at probably before you get your next dose. You know, um, and it informs you on when I should receive my next dose. Uh, and it's important mostly in the concept of you know, um, prophylaxis and prevention. We know that you know, um, the, lo the levels, the lower they get in general, you know, the more likely it is and the more severe the bleeding can be. So if we can always keep the factor level or concentration above a certain amount, you know, we can prevent much of that bleeding that occurs when levels are severely low. You know, and so if we target trough concentrations at those specific points and or higher, we can, uh, that can be effective for any given patient to prevent the bleeding uh, in the prophylactic fashion that we'd want them to have. So when you talk about you know, prophylaxis, that's the concept that's probably most important is, you know, what can I achieve with my troughs? You know, how much do I have to dose? How often do I have to dose it to keep this trough that I need to prevent my bleeding? So, you know, um, prophylaxis, you know, um, uh, uh, we talked about, you know, different ways to use the factor, you know, uh, and the two, the, the two kind of major ways to distinguish it is between prophylaxis and on-demand treatment. You know, and there's reasons to choose each of those. You know, not every patient is appropriate for prophylactic therapy as not every patient is appropriate to stay on on-demand therapy. You know, for patients who, uh, and, and most commonly, von Willebrand's patients are on treatment on demand. On demand means that you're going to use the factor when you need it, when, when your body, you know, demands it. You know, um, a typically a good patient who, uh, to use for on demand therapy are patients who have fewer bleeds, you know, uh, a, a, according to that annualized bleeding rate, for example. You know, um, you also want to kind of select patients who have fewer bleeds, but also bleeds that are less severe. You know, I certainly, you know, would consider being more preventative, you know, if a patient had, had, had you know, a joint bleed, you know, um, that debilitates them for months and months versus, you know, a patient who has, you know, uh, uh, a nosebleed once a year. So the severity of the bleed matters as well. You know, um, other, re other reasons why patients stay on on-demand th therapy is because they're unable to self-infuse. You know, it's very, very important that these are infusion therapies. And if you are unable to access that vein to put the medicine in it, you know, because you haven't had the training, you know, and it really is a matter of, for most people, a matter of training. Um, or if you, if you um, are, are unable to, tr to, to learn and are unable to access the medical resources to, to get the infusion, you know, that limits you to how often and how much of a factor you can receive, and on-demand therapy would be the default you know, to be able to receive any factor. Um, on-demand therapy also, if it's a concern, it typically does use less factor compared to prophylaxis, you know, arguably. So um, choosing prophylaxis, you know, probably the patients that are most appropriate to be on prophylaxis are patients who have severe disease. They have more frequent bleeding and patients who have more significant bleeding. You know, um, uh, prophylaxis does require, you know, IV access and most conveniently that means having uh, the ability to self-infuse uh, as opposed to having to get the help of a medical person or another person even to infuse for you. Uh, it also requires, you know, for, for our patients, you know, to be organized. You know, you're going to be dosing and, uh, and giving factor more or less on a schedule, and you have to kind of know how to keep that schedule to maintain the prophylaxis and the prevention that you're looking for. You know, um, uh, the most important reason really to consider prophylaxis is can we use this as a way to prevent the long-term consequences of the bleeding that's occurring? You know, we know with joint bleeds, the, the answer is absolutely yes. You know, it's much, much better to prevent joint bleeds than it is to treat joint bleeds after they've happened. You know, um, other bleeds, you know, uh, uh, and, and I go with prophylaxis, I think about it beyond just the disability of the joint bleed. I also, you know, uh, uh, think that 
we kind of sometimes forget about the fact that um, you know the prophylaxis studies not just looked at rates of joint bleeds and disability associated with them. They looked at quality of life. They looked at you know how did the joint bleeds affect a person's function, a person affect a patient's ability to go to school, to go to work, to be able to you know uh, attend um, social events and be with friends and family. You know those are things to consider too. Is you know my with my bleed are those my bleeding is are those things being affected and would the prophylaxis be able to help me be it at the places I want to be in my life you know um, uh, with with a preventative uh, a stroke rather than an on-demand stroke so um, uh, and I'm going to uh, hopefully uh, move on uh, from from the clinical things uh, with our, our, our inhibitor so you know we talked about inhibitors a lot and I'm hoping I can do it a little bit of justice in helping people understand what inhibitors are. It is a very, very rare phenomenon, you know, but it can be a very, very problematic, you know, complication if it were to develop. And the risk of pa the, the group of patients that it's most likely to happen sits here in this room, the group of severe patients who are unable to make the factor for themselves. So, you know, so this is my diagram, and this is my attempt at simplifying, you know, um, it for you. So um, in our bloodstream, you know, we have our immune systems, and our, and our immune system produce antibodies to any given, you know, uh, a, a protein uh, or infection. You know, they're meant to be there because they, our bodies want to get rid of anything that's not supposed to be there. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that if you don't make any, any, any factor, any Lorenz factor in this case, that's a foreign protein according to your body. And when you give the protein and it gets into your bloodstream, your immune system can or may see that as foreign and not supposed to be there, and it will go and these antibodies will find those proteins. They'll attach themselves to those proteins, and when these antibodies are neutralizing, they will eliminate those proteins. You know, um, uh, for the for the most part, you know, um, uh, not all antibodies can be problematic. You know, some antibodies may not neutralize, and uh, there's also the concept of kind of transient inhibitors or you know low titer inhibitors, and that's where these antibodies never rise to such high levels. We don't measure them, you know, um, uh, uh, so disproportionately. And uh, when, when that's the case, and you have a transient or low titer inhibitor, you can dose through it. You could give more factor, and you can dose more factor and give so much that there's not enough antibody to destroy all of them. You know, um, uh, there's, uh, with, with these transient low, low titer inhibitors, we can dose through them, and we have the expectation that in, in most circumstances, they would probably disappear on their own um, after a period of time. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there also is you know, kind of the circumstance where inhibitors can develop, and they develop not in a transient way, but in a more persistent way, you know, um, and that's when, uh, and, and, and that's kind of typically associated with having high titer inhibitors. You know, high titers means that you make a whole lot of antibodies, and when you make a whole lot of antibodies, it probably doesn't matter how much factor that you give, because every bit of factor that you give will be found by those antibodies, and every bit of factor you give will be neutralized by those antibodies. So those are the ones that are especially problematic in trying to treat, and the ones that we worry about you know, for this population are the persistent and high titer inhibitors. And of course, the complicating factor is um, in von Lohrband's patient is how do we define those inhibitors you know, in terms of all the different roles and functions that von Lohrband's plays. All right, so hopefully that helps, you know, kind of clinically speaking to some of the terms, you know, paint a picture for some of the terms that you've been hearing today. Um, I wanted to kind of really kind of spend a little bit of time also and talk a little bit about, you know, research and research studies and kind of really kind of discuss a little bit some of the terms you hear when more specific to, to, to doing studies as well. So, you know, uh, first of all, what are some of the types of research that, that we do? You know, um, and uh, and uh, and kind of uh, probably the most common ones, you know, especially with bleeding disorders, are you know the kind of use of uh, registries and the use of natural history studies. And the reason why these are are more common types are because, you know, this is a rare disease, and it's hard to get enough patients together to really do a randomized controlled trial. You know, and oftentimes the information we can get can be gathered and, and we can learn, you know, from you know, uh, studies that, that 
that can be um, done over time and can be very, very pointed and, uh, and, and, uh, um, and focused or targeted. So um, designs to studies matter as well. So you know, um, we talk about you know, studies that are designed to be longitudinal. We talk about studies that are designed to be retrospective and prospective as well. Um, and so, um, so we'll, uh, I'll see what I can do to help you understand that. So um, registries are, you know, are basically information gathering tools. And registries collect information more or less in an ad hoc time of way, kind of way. So it, uh, if a patient has such and such diagnosis, like von Willebrand's disease, uh, we would like to gather as much information as we can or very, very specific, specific information about that patient and their von Willebrand's disease. You know, it's, um, it, you may, in a registry, you know, gather 20 patients at a center in any given year. Uh, the next year, you may gather 12 patients. The next year, you may gather 30 patients, you know, it's, it's very ad hoc, you know, who comes uh, and who can we get the, the, the information from. Uh, those patients coming year over year, you know, it may be the same patient, you know, year over year that the data is being coming from, but it may be, you know, 10 different patients one year, 10 and another 10 patients altogether the following year. So we don't know if the data correlates from year to year to year in terms of how the, the, the disease progresses. So. Um, uh, a, data, uh, uh, a, a data gathering tool that is more systematic is a, what we consider a natural history study. You know, a natural history study takes a group of patients with that disease you know, um, uh, commonality and will follow those patients over a period of time. You know, it's specifically designed to be simply observational, so you know, there isn't any intervention plan, no treatment will be, would be provided specific, specified by the study. Um, you would just be treated and managed however you and your physician decide that you want to be treated, and then we would observe to see what happens, what the outcome is, what the um, complications may be, you know, uh, and what the good effects might be as well. You know, um, natural history studies by their design are typically designed to be longitudinal, so you would follow over time, and they're designed to be um, most commonly prospective as well. So, you know, from the time that you're enrolled, your data would be looked at going forward. You know, um, a retrospective design looks at, you know, your data from the time you're enrolled and looks back at what's happened to you at that point. Um, our prospective design, one that goes forward, is much, much more powerful in terms of the information that we gather, typically, than a retrospective design. So, and these are some examples of patient registries and uh, natural history studies that we've actually talked about, you know, are available to severe von Willebrand's patients through, you know, uh, the CDC and through the, the Afton, um, the, the group that really now is coordinating um, uh, these studies for us. So um, clinical trials, so, you know, you will probably have opportunity or be introduced to the opportunity to participate in clinical trials. You know, I mentioned before, you know, the, um, the, the, the prophylactic indication for the von Bendy and the recombinant factor, you know, that prophylactic indication came because they were, Takeda was able to complete a clinical trial that demonstrated that using prophylaxis was uh, in, in type 3 patients is, um, is effective and that it's safe to do. You know, um, uh, uh, the, um, the development of every treatment that you receive has to go through a cl clinical trials in order for the FDA or any other regulatory authority, you know, such as the EMA in Europe, you know, to, uh, to, to tell you as a consumer this is safe and, and effective. You know, the process of clinical trials is how we move from a drug that we think is effective to demonstrating it's effective and then be being allowed for it to be used commercially for, for all of our patients. So um, in clinical trials, if you're considering participation, you know, um, you will be faced with, you know, kind of the eligibility for that, that trial. You'll be faced with possibly, you know, um, will the trial randomize you? You know, um, uh, uh, and then you may also also hear talk about whether or not a trial is blinded and possibly even double blinded. You know, randomization, blinding, you know, um, double blinding in, in particular are probably going to be fair, fairly rare with these rare, rare diseases and how many patients, because of how many patients we can recruit for them. 
So an eligibility criteria you know, lays out, you know, these are the patients who we want to look at to, to, to try this, this, this clinical trial on. You know, um, it lays out those, those parameters. You know, so for example, if a specific study eligibility is for patients who are 18 years of age and who have von Willebrand's levels activities that are less than 20%, you have to have both those features in order to be put onto the study. If your von Willebrand's activity is 30%, that it's a no-go. If you're a child, you know, uh, uh, even if you're 17, it's still a no-go until you turn 18. So um, randomization on a trial, you know, um, is basically saying, you know, we're going to go on to this trial and we're going to let chance decide, you know, if when I go on this trial, what my treatment is going to be. Am I going to get this treatment versus am I going to get this treatment versus am I going to get a placebo treatment or, you know, any number of different other treatments. You know, rather than, you know, a, a physician or a patient looking at all those treat possible treatments and saying, well, I like that one the best, so I I'd like for you to put me on it. You know, everybody agrees that we'll look at all these arms and then, you know, kind of if it was a one-to-one -one randomization, it'd be an option of two and it'd be essentially like flipping a coin and being put onto one, one treatment versus another treatment. So that's what randomization is all about, is uh, we agree that we will let chance decide which one of these we will, will, will be treated with. Um, blinding, you know, refers to who knows about what the treatment is. You know, um, a, a, a blinded study, you know, or a single blinded study typically is the patient not knowing what their treatment may be. The randomization may occur, uh, but you will be provided the treatment according to the randomization, but you don't know what it actually is, whether, in, in particular, whether it's a placebo versus a treatment, you know, um, randomization. If you, uh, and, and what it does is it avoids, you know, the complications of a patient being placed on a placebo arm where you have a placebo trial and deciding, well, I'm not getting anything, I'd like to come off of the trial. You know, that's, a, that's what we call a treatment bias, you know, um, and, and treatment biases can interfere with the results you get from the study. So, you know, um, uh, 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 the, other, the other type of blinding is called a double blinding, uh, and that means that not only does the patient not know what their treatment is, but neither does the, the, the provider, neither does your physician know. Um, uh, only a limited number of people would actually would know, you would treat and continue through the study, and at the end, it, it typically, is when you find out which, which treatment was that you were receiving. All right. Um, uh, some other terms, endpoint, you know, uh, discontinuation, continuation of trials. Um, uh, I wanted to kind of make sure I spoke about discontinuation of clinical trials. So, you know, uh, discontinuation means that you stopped on the trial and people can be stopped for any number of reasons. You know, hopefully the, 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 the reason uh, that you are, if you're on a trial that you discontinue is because you reached an endpoint. You know, this is what the trial is trying to achieve, uh, so you reach that, 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 that achievement point, and so you can go ahead and end on the trial now. Uh, other reasons to discontinue on a trial would include the fact that, you know, all clinical trials should be voluntary, and if for whatever reason when you're on a trial and you decide, I don't want to do this anymore, you may request to be discontinued in your trial. Um, so and that's a very important concept is that nobody should ever coerce you or force you into doing a trial that you don't volunteer for and nobody should coerce you or force you to continue in a trial that you don't want to continue into even after you're enrolled into it. So um, sometimes also studies can be uh, stopped administratively, you know, because the conduct of the trial is not appropriate or the outcome of the trial is adversely affecting the patients who are on it, you know, administratively at that point trials would be discontinued. Uh, and then lastly, understanding continuation, discontinuation, all these clinical trials are not just, you know, started and stopped at random. You know, there's continual oversight to these trials and the safety of patients on clinical trials are extremely important. You know, and all trials are reviewed on a continuous fashion, most commonly at least on a once a year basis, making sure that everything is going well and according to plan, you know, uh, and, an, and a, an independent review board reviews that and allows a study to be continued year over year over year until it reaches completion. 
Right. Um, some statistical terms when you talk about clinical trials, and um, I just included this because more, more or less because uh, Jeanette asked for them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, but uh, the numbers needed to treat basically are, you know, kind of how many patients do you have to treat in order to prevent something from happening. And in this case, you know, I wanted to use an example of something else, you know, um, altogether, which is like a heart attack. We know that aspirin can be effective in reducing, you know, the harm that comes from heart attacks. Well, if you have to give 20 patients aspirin in order to prevent one of those people from getting a heart attack, then the numbers needed to treat would be 20 in that circumstance. So that's what that refers to. Um, and the numbers I gave you, are just out of my head. I do not know what, how much aspirin you have to give the people to prevent a heart attack from occurring. It may actually not be, be possible. Um, la lastly, statistical significance. You know, you hear a lot of patient, uh, of, of clinical trial data being presented to you and tell you, hey, this therapy is better than another therapy. And the question should always come, well, how do we, how do we really know that's better? And how do we know that that difference, that what is being said is being better, isn't being seen simply because it happened randomly by, by chance. You know, that's what statistical significance is about. It's kind of us trying to make a determination on a difference that we see is meaningful. You know, um, and, uh, and you know, st a statistical significance, you know, can be affected by several things. You know, one of the biggest things is how many patients you can study uh, in a group. You know, it is gonna be much, much more powerful when you find the difference between a thousand people compared to when you find a difference between 10 people. You know, if one of that person, one in 10 had a difference, that may actually be very likely to be random chance. But if, you know, um, that same difference, you know, occurred in a thousand people, even that one instance may be uh, significant. The other, you know, factor is how big is that difference? You know, if you have the difference in a, a scale of one to a hundred, if you had a difference of a hundred, you know, in that scale of 100, that's gonna be a much, much bigger difference and much more statistically significant than if the difference was simply one. You know, if you move the bar by 1% versus moving from zero to 100%. So that's the other concept as far as statistical significance goes. Most commonly, we express the statistical significance of data in, a, in what we call a p-value. You know, um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that number, you know, the lower the p-value, actually, the more statistically significant the, the, the data actually is. All right, so those are kind of a run through on, you know, those terms that you have, and hopefully some context, um, and, uh, and hopefully some insight onto how to understand kind of how you use those terms as you kind of go forward, you know, with the meeting and with your, um, with your own health care in the future. Thank you very much.